So now we're going to have Mark Schellenbaum talk to us about ZFS first mount. So, um, you know, in, in like 2001, 2002, I guess it was, Matt and Jeff were working on a user level prototype of what ZFS could be. The idea here was to get um, enough of a file system proof of concept so that Sun's upper management would finally buy into letting us write a new file system from scratch. Um, Sun had a history of starting and stopping file system projects over its history. There are at least four or five different attempts that had been done over the years, and, and ZFS actually started out as what they called the Pacific Program, um, which was kind of a grandiose plan to come up with a new storage, um, you know, subsystem. And it, that, that whole project kind of got like mired in kind of, you know, quicksand and kind of was, became very depressing for some people. And like myself and, and Mark Maybe, who were part of the, the file systems team at, at Sun, which was responsible for UFS and all the other physical file systems. And both of us actually came to Sun in the, in the late 90s with the kind of a carrot that was dangling in front of us that we're going to get to like possibly write a new file system. There was no guarantees we're going to get to do it, but that there was this really good possibility. And so it was, it was enough to sort of lure us away from other places we were working at the time. Um, and so then finally, Matt and Jeff actually got the prototype up, and up, up online and and uh, Mark Himmelstein finally said, yes, we're going to go forward with it. At that point, um, Jeff came looking for some other people for, to work on this. And he needed some file systems people because he didn't have any file systems experience. I mean, he didn't really have storage experience at this point in time. And so he came looking to uh, Mark and myself because we actually were file systems people who knew how to write file systems from scratch. And so we had an initial. Um, kickoff meeting in, in Broomfield, Colorado, I think it was about May of 2002. And in that meeting, um, there was actually people, there's people there that were not actually going to be part of the ZFS, but they're part of the, the Solaris volume management team at that time because they, they wanted to ma make sure we were being honest about what we could do with storage. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of, kind of ironic because they never actually even worked on the project at all, but they had to be there. And during that meeting, it was all about Matt and Jeff kind of presenting the architecture of what they've come up with at, at that time, which was, you know, it was, it was not, it was pretty minimal at, at that, that point in time. Um, and then the team kind of got broken down into, into basically the California team and the Colorado team. So you had the DMU and the SPA being done by Matt and Jeff in, in Menlo Park, and, and Mark Maybe and myself were doing the, the, the ZPL in Colorado. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, we only was actually knew how to write file systems, um, and we needed to get this whole POSIX layer. It's like, how do we put a POSIX file system on top of the DMU's object store? Um, a, a few months after that, probably about, maybe about four months or so later, Neil Perrin joined the team to actually start work on the initial ZIL that came along. And then between like May and a long time, we had to wait for Jeff to to get busy and actually port the, the spa to the kernel. And um, it, it, it seemed like it took forever. We um, were just waiting around. So, so in the meantime, what I actually went off and did was I actually went ahead and created the ZFS kernel module. And I actually had you know, the whole thing in there. I could, I could unload the module. I could, I, could do, I could mount a ZFS file system, even though I had no ZFS code to, to talk to. But I could actually mount the file system and do some very simple VFS level operations. What I couldn't do was like, you know, read any kind of data or anything, but I had a lot of the framework in place. And, one of the, and, 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 and during that time, Matt, Mark, and I, we also started talking about what we thought the ZPL should look like. And in the original prototype that Matt had, he had something called ZDS, which probably none of you have heard about before, that stood for ZFS Directory Services. So we, at that point, we, we renamed ZDS to be ZAP. And it became generalized to support, you know, multiple number of, of integers of a varying size. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the zap that you all know today. And then finally around, I think it was around like Labor Day of that year, um, over, over a weekend, which was typical for Jeff, he, he did like some massive amount of code. And he put it back into the ZFS gate. 
And the first thing that he actually had on there was he supported a, a Z-Vol because it was a single object. It was simple to test and simple to implement. And that actually became very, very important for us because at that same time, Lori Stevens was working on a project to make UFS in Solaris multi-terabyte. And due to the nature of the, you know, thin provisioning, we were able to actually test MTB UFS on top of a Z-Vol because we didn't actually have enough storage to, to, to have like, you know, a two terabyte file system at that point in the file systems team. <laughs> And so then, you know, and, and then we're going to move on to where, you know, where the, the whole ZPL was born. So we finally get our SPA in the kernel. And so at this point in time, you know, ZFS is actually composed of two different kernel modules. We had ZFS and we had SPA. Now, it, it lived that way until about three days before it got integrated into Solaris. Uh, it was a mad dash to merge these two modules together. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at this, you know, we, one thing we didn't want to do was like, don't make this look like UFS. I mean, UFS, you know, it was a great file system for its day, but it was, it was, it was kind of getting kind of, you know, it had stability issues inside of Solaris. You know, if you, if you, if you made any code changes for it, you know, something else would turn up to where people were just intimidated to work on it. And we needed to have a file system that people were confident that they could like burn a subsystem to the ground and, and re-implement it, you know, on a, on a weekly basis if necessary. And so we wanted, you know, to basically look at UFS because it was kind of, you know, the gold standard as to what a file system should look like on Solaris. But I don't want to, you know, re-implement it, in, you know, with ZFS interfaces. Um, and so I was looking, we were looking around and there was a concept, and you, this may surprise you, that PCFS had. It wasn't about the way that it put data on the disk or anything like that. It had to do with the way it used the VFS. And, and PCFS liked to separate its FOP tables based on files or directories. And this avoided all the, all the checks inside of, the, inside of all the, you know, the VOP code to say, you know, is this V type a V reg? And I'm working on a directory operation, then, you know, it would error off. And it's like, I wanted to get rid of all that. And, and so we basically took the, the concept of multiple VOP tables from PCFS, but we did it on kind of steroids where we did it to everything, like sim links and all, all kinds of other objects. Um, another one of our things we wanted to do, and this one was, was very controversial to the NFS team, was we never ever wanted to support VOPRW lock, which was a very large hammer to serialize write activity from the syscall layer. Now at Sun, we went through a number of projects where we were actually trying to let database consumers come through without holding the right lock because it was because holding the right lock was impeding their performance and so we did we didn't want to have that same problem and so but the the NFS team was like oh oh but we depend on that and so if you've ever looked in like the the vatter t of in solaris you'll see that there's something called a, a v sequence number that was the compromise we had to make with the NFS team to allow us to actually do this and that and the purpose there is so that they can tell whether or not the attributes have changed from one, from one call to another. Um, another idea that we had was we wanted to always have an extensible um, Z node or I node format so that we were never like locked in like, like UFS or any other file system that's pretty much out there in the world. Um, and so the very first ZPL that we had is actually entirely built around zap. So there was a zap attribute for M time, C time, size, you name it. Everything was, was an attribute. Um, now, that, that, that made it easy for us to very rapidly prototype this first version of the ZPL in just a matter of a few months. Um, it did not have the performance characteristics we really wanted long term, but that's how we actually did the very first version. Um, we also had a very strong desire to never use the DNLC. Um, that one actually didn't work out so well. We actually did have to put that in, and that was primarily because we needed to improve our our attribute lookup and um, performance for, for Git Adder. Um, it's kind of unfortunate that we had to do that, but that's what we, what we did. Um, and the, the problem with the DNLC is it causes all kinds of other side effects that are really not desirable, like it will postpone a lot of delete activity from being performed on the file system due to um, negative caching on the DNLC. The directory name lookup cache. So it's a piece of code that hasn't been touched in like, you know, 
realistically in like since, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so the first testing that we actually did for the, the ZPL was, and this is kind of interesting, was doing a bring over with the, the, old, the old teamware tool, tools. Um, it was actually a, a tremendous test suite because it would do a multiple SCCS Git operations in parallel, and it would expose all the kinds of races that you have in lookup and inactive in a file system. And so the goal here was we were actually trying to work on the, the, the old hello message that was going to come out in the Sun Engineering team, which was basically what Jeff wanted to do was he wanted to be able to, to, to pull down or bring over the, the Solaris date command and compile it and then run it from, from the, the ZPL. And this was like around Halloween of, of you know, 2002, I guess. And uh, I'm having a problem with, with getting the, the bring over to work. So, you know, I'm going through a series of panics and I finally like, I, I finally get past the, the, the inactive issue. And then I can't get past, you know, trying to build it because it's trying to do a rename on me. And of course, rename is one of the most complicated VOPs to implement. And Jeff's calling me on the phone like, well, can't you just stub it all out? It's like, well, the parts that are doing are the hard parts. Uh, so I had to just kind of slog it out and, and you know, finally finish it. Um, and then, you know, eventually we actually achieved that on the, on the, on the day he wanted and we were able to, uh, to uh, send out our hello message and, uh, and, you know, and all was well. But, you know, I, I would say that, you know, over, over the two months where I, we were doing this work, it was perhaps the most fun I ever had, you know, as a software engineer. Um, at the very beginning, like, in the first couple of weeks, like, Mark maybe was in my office, you know, like, all day. We're sitting there, like, trying, trying to get, like, you know, simple read to work. And then once we finally got that to work, th 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 then we kind of, like, divided up the VOPs. And he went off and did some of them, and I did some of them. And then we would come back together every couple of days. Um, and then the other thing that I, I ended up having to do was I, need, I wanted to, you know, after we had the, the whole thing kind of up and running, it's like, okay, I need to find a way to find out like what I missed, you know, from an interface perspective. And so there's this test suite called SVVS, System 5 Verification Suite. It's an old AT&T test that, that verifies the, the SVID or the System 5 interface definition. And so I, that, that, that test suite was a problem to get to run on, on, on ZFS because everything in it was built around, around UFS. So I had to like basically tear that whole thing apart and get all the mounting code changed and everything. And then with a lot of these test suites, you know, you have to like compile them and then run them. You, they won't ever like save you a, a copy of it off. So once I got the whole thing running, I actually just saved it all off as a giant tar file so I could unload it whenever I wanted to. And we start running through all these tests. And of course, you know, there's a number of things that are failing. And it's like, okay, now, all right, this, does, this doesn't work. Uh, let, me, let me go take a peek and see what UFS did here. So I go look at there, it's like, oh, that's what that piece of code there that nobody understood was for. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of a learning experience because, you know, as, as a side effect of doing this, I actually gained more insight into some of the, you know, the POSIX-isms inside of UFS. Um, so one other thing I think I, I, should, I should mention is, so, you know, when Jeff put this code back, I spent like about, I don't know, it was a half a day or a day trying to figure out like, all right, how can I use this? Because at this point in time, we had no, there was not multiple spas, there was not more than one object set. It was just, there was like pretty much nothing that, that you have today was there. And so I finally like, you know, found some like, you know, global symbols that I could like hook into and, and use in my ZFS module and it's like, all right, and I wrote a little mount program. It's like, all right, but I don't have a way to create the file system. So for, for at least the first couple months of, of ZFS, the way you actually created a file system was I would mount it, and it would go and look for an object, and if it wasn't there, it would then go and create it as a side effect. Uh, and it lived that way for quite some time, actually. But, but, but then eventually, you know, I went and wrote, all, you know, the first primitive um, little ZFS utility, which then let us create file systems and, and mount them. And, you know, from day one, we never wanted to have a file system that, you know, had to go lay out inodes or anything like that, but it was just, you know, basically a case of, 
we need to create a, you know, a root directory and I, and I need to have a way to find out where that directory is. And so that's where things like the master node came up, which is, you know, it's kind of ZFS is equivalent of a super block, but, you know, way, way pared down from what it, UFS would have in it. So that's about it for, you know, getting to the first mount. I'll be glad to take any questions people have. Not really. I mean, so one of our, one of our, uh, he wanted to know if there's anything that I that we liked in UFS, and there were a number of things that, to dislike about UFS. One of them was it had a series of really really hard bugs relating to the virtual memory subsystem that we did not want to reintroduce with ZFS. Another one that was that that drives me crazy to this day actually is it is a file system built around macros, and these macros are all lowercase. And you're sitting there, you know, di disassembling code, and you're trying to figure out like what this function is, and you can't even find, you know, you're looking for like, where is this thing? It's like, oh, it doesn't even exist because it's a macro. Um, <laughs> and so it was, it, you know, it's like there's there's no way we wanted to introduce any of that kind of nonsense inside of ZFS. George. Um, Matt, Mark, and I did talk early on about, okay, um, the, the question was, did we have any discussions about integrating with the, with the, like the page cache and the buffer cache on the system? Um, Matt, Mark, and I did have discussions on this when, when, when Matt first started working on the ARC. Um, we kind of came away from the conclusion, at least at that point in time, that it was going to be too much work, and so we didn't really do it. Um, the, the question is, are there any things that we, we, that we have regretted we did? Um, I guess the, you know, not so much on, say, the ZPL, but I guess I would say that with the way we, block pointers maybe weren't fully virtualized. Um, you know, th things like that. But, you know, as far as, like, the way the, the ZPL was, was put together, probably not. Um, we, we, did, we did actually walk away from the ZAP model because it didn't perform real well. And we went to a, 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 a fixed format version for a while, but then we came back to the original vision, which was an extendable attribute model. So the question is, when did, when did mirroring and RAID Z came in? Um, so ironically, we actually had more advanced um, VDEV types at one point. We had CONCAT and other types that lived for a while. Um, RAID-Z came in, like we put back ZFS in, a, you know, Halloween of 2005. Um, RAID-Z came in, I think, like October 1. Um, <laughs> it came in really, really late. Um, mirroring had been there for a couple years, I think. Any other questions? All right.